Hello, everyone. Um, look at how many of you are here today. That's nice. That's very nice. Thank you very much for coming. I'm I really appreciate this. I'm really glad to see you all here. And it works. So my name is, as already mentioned, Jakub Sowinski. You can find me on the internet as Suvka or Pan Suvka. I work as software architect in Stepstone Services. Um, my main area of focus in this work on a daily basis is, um, generally speaking, front-end web development. Now, I joined this company four years ago as a software engineer in order to work on um, development and maintenance of one of our core products, which is online job board. You know, this kind of website where users can um, search for interesting job offers based on some criteria, um, browse them, read them, apply to them if they will, and of course, much, 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 much more. Now, as you can imagine, when I joined this company, the project that I was supposed to work on turned out to be slightly more complicated and complex than I would have expected initially both in terms of business logic and the amount of functionalities, but also in terms of technical solution and architecture that was there in place. Basically, it was one big repository of over 6 million lines of code, um, written without too much attention paid to code modularity, isolation, re reusability, readability, etc., etc. Um, I bet you know this story, either from your own experience or from plenty plenty of cases described all over the internet. Basically, when I joined the company, the spaghetti, the power of spaghetti was already really strong in the code. And it only got stronger uh, with time when we were adding new features, new layers of macaroni on top of everything. Now, with time, it became harder and harder for us to add new features without producing uh, additional bugs, sometimes in an entirely different part of the application. Um, it was easier and easier for us to produce a bug. It was harder and harder to release new version of the application. Eventually and ultimately, we got stuck. Back then, it took us seven days to release new version of our application from developers' computers to production environment. We had one release per week. Nowadays, we are able to release pretty much any piece of business logic or user interface from developers' computer to production in less than 30 minutes, of course, not omitting any of those standard steps that are along the way, such as testing. We achieved this um, because of, as a matter of fact, still ongoing transformation to service-oriented architecture. But it couldn't be possible if we didn't extend this idea of service-oriented architecture to front-end web development. And this is precisely what I'm here today to talk to you about. Um, idea of extending service-oriented architecture to front-end development, an approach often referred to as micro-front-ends. Now, I will go through this topic step by step, tackling one question at a time. I will start with an attempt to define what is a micro-front-end. Then I will give you a few reasons to use it, and then I will move on to this most technical part where I will show you how do we do them, how do we create micro frontends in my project. Uh, but let's start from the beginning. Micro frontend, as I already mentioned, is direct extension of idea of micro services or service-oriented architecture in general to front-end development. Therefore, analogically to service or microservice, micro frontend is small, separate, logically separate, uh, part of your application, or maybe in this context, part of user interface of your application. Most important feature, it is autonomous, independent in deployment. You can deploy it without, theoretically, without affecting the rest of your system. Additionally, it's best if such micro frontend is created by one team, which is responsible for some certain area of your application end to end, and it's best if it encapsulates some um, piece of business logic, some part of your domain of your application. Such application created with micro frontends can look to our end users like this as a regular application, regular website. But in fact, under the hood, it might be built like this as a composition of separate micro applications. 
Each one of those applications has its own code base, its own code repository, its own pipeline to push this code through from developer's computer to production through every other environment, its own version on each of those environments at any given point of time, and also its, uh, its own team that is responsible for the area in which this micro frontend is. Now, this idea of code separation um, into logical, logically decomposed small subsystems is nothing new. You might have heard about it only in relation to front-end development uh, as vertically decomposed systems or self-contained systems. Or lately, there is this term microservice websites. But um, with gain in popularity with rise of micro front -end, microservices and service-oriented architecture in general in the past years, you will see that um, this term is being widely adapted, this architecture is being widely adapted and referred to as micro frontends. Um, you will find plenty of uh, talks and articles coming from employees of such companies like Facebook, Spotify, Microsoft, uh, where they share their experiences with building their own products in this exact approach. And now you have one from StepStone. Um, so if they do uh, use this approach, it must be not without reason, right? Let's try to find out what the reasons are. In our case, I can say for Facebook or for Microsoft, I can say for my project. And in our case, we had a few very special reasons to use this approach. Here is the diagram that represents, of course, in vastly simplified way, architecture of our application. As you can see, we have separate storages dedicated to separate backend services, which are then dedicated to their own separate front-end services or micro front-ends. And then there is this small thin layer on top of everything, consolidation or composition layer. If we add teams to this context, to this diagram, some of the benefits of using this approach become very clear and obvious. As you can see, you can end up implementing this approach with small autonomous teams which are heavily focused on the customer. Each one of those teams owns some separate, logically separate part of the application end to end. Each one of them ships some value directly to the users. There are no more pure API teams that serve only other developers. Every member of every team has some tangible impact on value that is brought to the end user and can see it, can measure it. It, of course, translates to um, satisfaction, dedication, commitment of those developers. But it also translates to the fact that they all work on uh, largely reduced scope compared to what was previously. You see, in our case, our business domain, it became simply too big for one person to know it all. We had to split it into separate, logically separated um, entities and assign each one of them to separate team which owned this entity end to end. Thanks to this, our developers could actually become experts in those small areas, small subdomains um, of our whole application. Them, then, having that deep understanding of both business-related and technical-related uh, stuff that's going on in this area, enabled them to create codes of much higher quality and generally design solutions of much higher quality than to those that compared to what was before, compared to how it looked like when they had to know whole domain of our application. Both of those things that I mentioned, combined with this assumption that every entity in your system, every micro frontend, is easily and quickly deployed to production in, let's say, less than 30 minutes, directly translate and affect to you affect your speed and agility of your development. Imagine you have small focused teams full of experts that are really keen on this specific area who have tools to put results of their work, uh, ship it directly to the users in a few minutes or 20 or 30 minutes. The, such environment, such infrastructure, highly encourages experiments, often iterations, small changes, basically everything that is encapsulated in this term um, agile software development. And that's what we want to do. We want to be agile, so that's what we do. Additional benefit that comes out of this approach is uh, the fact that you can progressively refactor your application in a convenient way. Having your system 
split it, separated by design into logical entities, enables you to, with minimal risk, take one of those entities out and replace it with an entirely new one, theoretically without too much impact on the rest of the system. This way, we can progressively enhance our uh, quality of our application or progressively refactor specific elements of our application whenever and wherever it is needed. OK, but there are a few things I want you to keep in mind while I'm bragging about all of those benefits of micro frontends. One is the fact that architecture is a tool. As a tool, it is designed to address and efficiently fix specific issues. We use this tool because it addresses issues that we have. It's not meant to be used by everyone and everywhere. Moreover, you will rather commonly see that it's um, recommended to start with monolithic architecture. Uh, this is because this, this pattern is good, it's simple, and most importantly, it's solid. It just does the job. Truth is, most of the applications that are created today will never grow in size to the extent where they will need this kind of scaling by decomposition. All righty. This is what and how. No, this is what and why. Now is how. Uh, let's go back to this diagram I have shown you before. This is a representation of our application. And let's focus now on this small consolidation layer on top of everything. We call this layer templating engine. On ground level, templating engine is supposed to uh, get user's request, translate it to some specific template, and populate this template with uh, fragments or micro frontends. As you can see in this example, um, templating engine takes request of the user based on the URL maps it to some certain template. Here is an example of, oh no, uh, first, we created this solution with Taylor, which is open source library uh, provided by Zalando, of course, heavily modified. And we use Taylor because it enables us to uh, create all of those connections in nice, convenient, human readable way. Um, this is an example of implementation of road to template mapping in our templating engine. As you can see, whenever templating engine receives a request that ma matches one of those routes, it will render a uh, corresponding template. Then here is an example of a template. Uh, as you can see, most of the time, it's just collection, composition of different fragments. Each fragment has its own small configuration. And most importantly, each one of them has its own unique ID. Now, here is map between IDs and actual locations of those micro frontends. So templating engine, when rendering given template, it will replace each fragment with content that comes from specific micro frontend. Now, of course, beneath this templating engine, we have uh, micro frontends, which besides being provided, rendered by templating engine, they also sometimes need to communicate with each other. We satisfy this need with simple implementation of very well-known pattern publisher subscriber. Um, as you can see in this example, which represents login model uh, implemented as React component, whenever this component is mounted, mounted on the page, uh, it will subscribe to a very certain specific message. And whenever such message is published, it will react in a very specific way. In this, in this case, it will just pop up. This is an example of message publishing. Um, whenever some micro frontend publishes such a message uh, on a page where in the same context there is this login form available, this will result in a login form pop-up or being triggered. As a matter of fact, you can test it on your own. You can go to our homepage, stepson.de, and put this exact line of code in developer's console, and it will also cause um, this login model to trigger. You will trigger it programmatically. OK, so this is uh, like this general view uh, of the architecture when it comes to our templating engine. Now let's see uh, how does it look from developer's perspective. How, 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 how does he do this? How does he create micro frontends in my project? Well, first and foremost, we create and maintain our micro frontends in standardized and automated way. You see, in this architecture, by design, you want to have um, separate repositories and separate pipelines, separate release processes for pretty much every other logically separated piece of user interface you can have. 
So naturally, you will end up with tens, if not hundreds, of different release processes and repositories, and you will create ones daily. You need to take control over this scattered landscape, and it cannot be done, or at least couldn't be done in our case, without standardization of all of those moving parts and automation of interactions between them. One of the most useful tools we have came up with um, that satisfies those needs is tool for automated project creation. Using this tool, our developer can, in like one or two minutes, generate entirely new, standardized template or maybe foundation of a new micro front end that he wants to create. Um, it literally takes like one or two minutes and providing a few simple basic configuration values. Now, what he will gain are, is code repository, of course, standardized, standardized build plan, standardized deployment plan. Build plan, which is a process in which we take the code as it is on developers' computers and prepare it to be served to our end users. And deployment plan, a process in which we actually put this uh, prepared build package on some environment so that the user can fetch it from there. One important note I have about deployment plans is that um, when, user, when our developer is generating new micro frontend, he can select if, if he wants it to be deployed as Node.js based microservice or as just a simple static asset. If it's deployed as Node.js based microservice, then it will be rendered on the server side and served to the user as a static HTML. And if it will be deployed as a static asset, then it lands on one of our CDNs and it's taken directly from there, handled on the client side. Of course, uh, there is also this code repository that comes out of the box for our developer, and it contains skeleton of the application. And the skeleton itself contains a set of standard libraries that we are using for development of our interfaces. Now, you might find it a little bit counterintuitive or maybe unusual because one of the major benefits of such distributed approach, at least for the backend side, is the fact that you can create pretty much every other entity in your system with entirely different technology, and it will work, and it will be fine. We consciously decided to ditch this benefit because we saw more prawns on the other side of the coin. Having standardized tech stack, we can easily share knowledge, easily cooperate above the teams, easily um, share solutions, not reinvent the wheel all over again with every other new library that we are using. It also enables our developers to switch teams and projects conveniently, but maybe most importantly, directly affects our performance. We have actually went one step further and created standard front-end vendor package, thanks to the fact that we are using the same libraries for every micro front-end we have, and we put those libraries there. Then it's loaded once at the very beginning of your journey with StepStone websites, and then every micro front-end we ship, uh, it's shipped with an assumption that those libraries are already there on the page. So it's not shipped with those libraries, and hence, performance benefit. Of course, there are plenty, plenty other tools in the shed for our developers to um, build efficiently those micro frontends in standardized, reusable way. One of them being library of reusable components, another one of them being a standard styling system, which is based on style components. Of course, I don't have time today to tell you about all of those details. My time on this stage is quite limited. But I, of course, invite all of you to approach me either here or on Twitter or wherever, and uh, discuss those fine details in any case. Nevertheless, uh, last thing I am here to do is to sum it up quickly for you. As with all things, this approach has its pros and cons. Cons, quite high uh, entry level and convoluted setup and a lot of work in automation and standardization. But if you actually manage to do it and manage to do it properly, you will see great benefit in speed and agility and continuity of your de development in large-scale applications. I think that's it. I think that's it from me today. You can find slides online if you need. You can find me on Twitter. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jacob.